have you. Today we're picking uh, right up where Pastor Steve left, uh, left us off last week. Can't talk. I've been on vacation for a week and I lost it all. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Mark chapter 5 was where you guys started, and uh, we're going to start in verse 21 today. So if you have your Bibles, you can get there. Uh, we'll also have it on the screens for you. And in, in case you missed a week, today is the third part in a seven-part series. Now, what's cool about this series is it has a sort of mini-series within the series, and the mini-series happens in weeks two, three, and four. Last week, this week, and next week as we unpack Mark chapter 5, verse by verse. Now, three miracles in three weeks, all from the same chapter. Now, I get it, okay? There were other options. In, in Matthew chapter 8, the, there are four miracles that are recorded. In the very next chapter, chapter 9, Matthew records five miracles. So we have nine miracles in two chapters, okay? So I'm not saying this is the most loaded chapter, right? John, John in his entire gospel, he only tells us about eight miracles. Um, Luke, in chapter 8 of his gospel account, tells us about four miracles. And I just, I don't know, this, this week I just got, I love how God used different men with different gifts and different abilities and different perspectives to tell the world about who he is. I, I just, I love the four gospels. I love God's word. If I was only allowed to teach from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I'd be perfectly fine with that. Like, seriously, it's just that good. Like, I never get tired of it. I never, never get burnt out on the magnificence of Christ. I'll never get bored telling you about the Savior of my soul. Never. In fact, I think this is where a lot of modern preachers and teachers really get it wrong. See, for whatever reason, they fall for the lie that they need to cute it up. They need to make things pretty. You, you with me? Like they, they, like, they feel that they need to get, like, creative with God's Word and massage it so that it truly captivates and truly convicts. See, that's why we get these teaching series in churches on best-selling books and blockbuster movie titles, right? Some of you have come from this, and you've landed here, and we're so grateful to have you. One church uh, did a series themed around the Lion King. No joke. Like, if, you're, if you think I'm making this stuff, I'm not making this stuff. This stuff happens. Like, there was dancing lions and stuff. I'm not even kidding. So why does this stuff happen? Well, it happens because they grow bored with the story of the Bible, so they've had to try and find ways to make it more exciting so that they could reach more people. But see, here's the problem with that. See, if, if you move away from God's Word and you see more people. Like, if you move away from God's Word and you see success, let me just ask you, what are you less likely to come back to? God's Word. You're not going to come back. Your, your own success, apart from God's Word, tricks you into thinking you don't need His Word. And it's simply a lie straight from the Father of lies. And so the power and the, and the treasure of God's Word is simply indescribable. It's magnificent. The truth about Jesus is a love story that cannot be overtold. It cannot be exhausted. But the truth is, it's so easy for us to exit the honeymoon, the honeymoon, <laughs> the honeymoon phase, right? It's easy for us to, to lose enthusiasm, right? We become bitter towards others. We start to love the world. We make compromises where we know we shouldn't. We become judgmental and even arrogant. And we can do all the right things. We can show up and we can do the Christian living thing. And we can check all the boxes, but we lack love. Jesus noticed this in the church in Ephesus. He says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, But I have this against you, church that you have abandoned the love you had at first. See, it is my passion. It is the passion of my life to lead people to a love relationship with Jesus Christ and to help them keep and grow that love. And for as long as I'm breathing, I'm telling you, we will be a church that is committed to truth, persistent in grace, and motivated by love. Did you hear me? I just want to make sure we're really clear where I'm coming from. And here's the thing. 
I love your enthusiasm. I love that you want to clap at that, but we shouldn't have to clap at that. That should be a base expectation for pastors of the, that are leading gospel-centered churches. It should be a fundamental expectation, but it's not. It's clappable now. As long as I'm your pastor, we will be committed to truth, persistent in grace, and motivated by love. I promise you. If you're a believer today, maybe 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 you're tired maybe 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 some of you have have maybe lost a little bit of that fire in you that love for christ maybe you're stuck in an empty routine that lacks any real relationship jesus tells you what to do next in the very next verse he's talking to the church in ephesus he says remember therefore where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first. Jesus says, pursue after me like you did when we first met. Recall the day that you proclaimed to the world that you would follow me and recall the life that you left behind to do it. Let your love be stirred as you contemplate, as you are reminded of my grace. Jesus says, I'm right here. I've never moved. You got distracted, right? You got lazy. You got bitter. You got arrogant, so turn away from those things and reach out for me like you did when we first locked eyes. Then continue in the things I've taught you. Then and only then should you pursue me. Paul drives this point home in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's known as the wedding chapter. So much more than that, though. Check it out. He says, if I speak in human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Cymbal. Man, we have a lot of gongs and cymbals walking around. Too many Christians have smooth talk but no walk. See, if I have the gift of prophecy, Paul continues, and, and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love. I am nothing. I can know all things. I can understand all things. I can have incredible faith. But if I have no love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. I mean, yeah, I don't think you can miss the point on that even if you tried. Without love, you have nothing. See, but God knows the deepest, most hidden desires of your heart, the intimate longings of your heart. He's not, look, if there is a summation of today, this is it. Please get this. If you get nothing else, get this. He is, God is not concerned about the movement of your hands and your lips if he does not first have your heart, period. I just want to make sure you got that. He does not care about the movement of your hands and your lips if he does not first have your heart. But let me encourage you. Re-entering a love relationship with Jesus Christ is not, it's not complicated. It's not hard to do. In fact, we're going to see today that even in complete chaos, an outstretched hand towards the king of mercy sets off alarms in the kingdom of heaven. King Jesus notices the unnoticeable. King Jesus touches the untouchable. King Jesus forgives the unforgivable. And King Jesus loves the unlovable. You see, the kings of this world, they insist on giving you a title. You with me? They insist on creating division by creating labels and categories for people and getting everything where they ought to be. King Jesus makes it clear that there are only two types of people. There are people who call him Lord, and there are people who do not. And the people who do not are only an outstretched arm away from being called sons and daughters of God. Folks, we must not lose our first love, and we must not keep it to ourselves. Our miracle for today is found in Mark chapter 5. It's also found in Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 8, so take your pick, okay? Not one, not two, 
but three credible eyewitnesses recording in their writing, their recollection, their memory of the events that they saw that day. If that's not compelling historical evidence, I don't know what is. And this part of the, the chapter five is a bit of a Mark sandwich. Um, it's a miracle within a miracle, and I wasn't sure how to handle that. So I'm, uh, we'll see how I do, right? Um, but, but our goal with this series is simple. We, we want you to see that the miracles of Jesus demonstrate Jesus' absolute authority over the devil, sickness, nature, sin, and death, over all of it. He is over all of it. But let me just back up real quick and give you the big picture, okay? Humanity fell as a result of sin in Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, right? You can find that in Genesis 3. Uh, there's a tree, there's a rule, just don't do this, right? But we can't resist because humanity wasn't okay with God being God. Humanity wanted to be God. So immediately, humanity is launched into sin. And sin, much like a virus, forced its way into the entire world and infected every human. And this wasn't like an infection that was going to go away, you couldn't, like, immunize for it, right? This was an infection that had no mercy. It was relentless. This pandemic was here to stay. So much so that humanity became slave to sin. It corrupted every corner of humanity, every corner of creation. In fact, Paul uses a phrase to describe this shift. In Romans 8, 20, he says, For the creation was subjected to frustration. That frustration, it speaks to the introduction of the result of sin. Sickness, sorrow, suffering, death, all leading to forever and eternal separation from God the Creator in hell. That's what took place. This has stood. That is the ROI or the return on investment for humans seeking to be their own gods. And it is dark and it is destitute. And so... As we sit here facing that reality, the only question left to ask is, is there an escape? Is there a way out? Is there any hope for us to be released from what binds us? Is there any way that we can be freed from what the Bible would call bondage to decay? And the answer is an emphatic yes, yes, yes. There is a deliverer, there is a rescuer, there is a savior, there is hope in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Right? And Matthew and Mark and, and, and Luke and John, they all have the same goal as they tell us this story of Jesus' ministry, of the good news of Jesus Christ. They all set out to declare to the world that Jesus came to crush Satan and conquer sin and death. John is the last gospel, and he wraps up the synoptic gospels, all four of the gospels, very well in John 20, verse 31. He says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So we have the Word of God. We have, in the Word of God, we have evidence, folks. We have proof that Jesus is the only Savior from sin. It is Jesus who will reverse the curse, right? It is Jesus who will crush Satan and toss all his homies into the lake of fire for eternity. It is Jesus who will destroy sickness and sorrow and suffering. It is Jesus who will be the death of death itself. And it is Jesus who will give all who believe in him everlasting life. It is Jesus. Today we're going to see the awesome authority of Jesus Christ over the power of sickness. And trust me when I say, if he did it then, he can do it again. Let's dive in. Verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her. So that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now, Jairus is a big time, wealthy, influential synagogue official. Okay, he's big stuff, right? And being that he was a prominent member in his community, he had access to the best medical care possible. 
Yet despite their best efforts, the doctors told him, your daughter doesn't have much time left. She might not make it through the day. And so in his desperation, he thinks, maybe this Jesus guy can help. But notice, Jesus, or Jairus, was a religious leader, right? Now, you don't have to be a biblical scholar to know that religious leaders weren't all that crazy about Jesus. They weren't all that excited about him. But this father is so desperate to not lose his only child. He says, so what if it's true? He says, well, what if this Jesus character is actually who they say he is? And so Jairus runs around town asking everyone he can talk to, where's Jesus? Do you know where Jesus is? And finally he finds him, falls at his feet, and begs Jesus to come and to heal his daughter at his home. So Jesus went with him. Verse 24. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So out of nowhere comes this woman with all these issues. Now, I, I just need to be honest with you here, okay? Uh, don't, don't, don't judge me, all right? If Jesus is going with me to heal my daughter Madison, it, it, who is dying, I'm sorry, but I don't have time for your issues, woman. I'm so, I got my own issues, I got stuff going on in my life. This, this woman has the nerve to interrupt Jesus' trip to heal this, this wealthy, influential, religious man's daughter. Like, can you just, with me, please put on your desperate parent hat for a moment? Like, hold up, lady. I was here first. I got the money. I got the influence. The crowd followed me here, and they didn't come to see you be healed. They came to see my daughter be healed. So back off. We're given the rich man's name. Did you notice that? But we're not even told this poor woman's name. She's a nobody. She's an outcast. Nobody cares about her. See, Mark wants us to know that everyone knew who Jairus was that day. Everyone knew who he was. And in comes this lady, and nobody knows her name. She's poor. And whatever she did have is gone now due to the piling up of medical bills. And it's not just that no one knew her name. It's not even that she's poor. It's that the disease she had rendered her ceremonially unclean. Basically, no one would touch her. She wasn't even allowed in the temple. In fact, she wasn't welcome in Israel's religious scene at all. Whatever she practiced had to be done in private. See, it's important for you to understand that, that this woman was an inconvenience to society and her family for over a decade. If she touched her husband, he was unclean. If she hugged her children, they were unclean. If she touched her friends, they were unclean. If she bumped shoulders with a stranger in the marketplace, they were unclean. Like, can you just try and imagine what life was like for this woman? My goodness. Well, you know, Josh, the, in middle school, the kids said I had cooties. Look, okay, I'm sorry for that, all right? That must have been horrible for you. I'm not trying to make little of your childhood trauma, but at least I didn't follow you home or ban you from church or impact your family for over a decade. Luke says this is incurable. Nothing could be done for her. All hope was lost. Verse 27. But when she heard about Jesus. See, people around town, they'd been talking about this Jesus guy. Word had gotten out that he had been helping a lot of people, and this woman had, had lost all hope. She thought to herself, maybe, just maybe, Jesus can help me too. Let me ask you something. If you were living with an incurable disease that had all your friends and your family and your neighbors avoiding contact with you, eventually, just, just tell me, eventually, what would you start doing? I'd, I'd start avoiding them, right? You'd start avoiding them because if you avoid them, then at least you don't have to deal with the constant rejection over and over and over again of them avoiding you. It's a defense mechanism. The last place you'd be is around a crowd. But she'd heard about Jesus' healing power, and she
she believed it. See, after living life, avoiding crowds, look at what she does next. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. So in an act of faith to avoid embarrassment and possible public shame, this woman sneaks her way in and touches his cloak. Why the cloak? Why not his sandals or his hair? What, like what, what's going through this woman's head? What's her game plan here? See, I think this lady knows her Bible. I do. I think she's been going to Bible study. And here's what she's thinking as she's developing her plan to reach for the clothing of Jesus. Look at this. In Romans, or sorry, uh, Numbers chapter 15, verse 38. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, Throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at, and so you will remember all the commands of the Lord. See, this woman wasn't reaching out for the clothes because that's what she thought gave her the best chance, or she thought, well, that's what I can grab. No, she was doing it to show her faith in the promises of God and the commands of her God. She wanted to grab onto those tassels and hang on just like she was grabbing onto the promises of God for 12 years. Man, don't miss this, folks. She's sneaking up behind God in the flesh. She's reaching out to grab the tassels that are there to remind her of God's promises. And the one wearing those tassels is none other than the Messiah sent by God to fulfill those promises and to bring healing and peace to those who know him and love him. Step aside, Hollywood. The big boys are here, right? Man, that's good. Listen to me very carefully. This woman knew something that you must not leave today without knowing. If you trust in the promises of God while clinging to the work of his son, then you have unstoppable power at work in your life. Unstoppable. Man, if some of us just had an ounce of her confidence, can you imagine what we could do? what God could do through us. Can you imagine? See, some of us have heard it be taught that this lady was acting in superstition, right? That, 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 that somehow she thought that, you know, if the robe, if she could touch it, then the power would just transfer to her, which was common thinking in that day. But this is not a magic trick. Not just that, but go read Leviticus 15. Right? I'm not going to read it to you, okay? But you aren't supposed to touch someone when you're bleeding because it makes them unclean. So in order for the woman to pull this off, she had to break the law that God gave. And guess who she touched to break the law that God gave? God in the flesh, the one that made the law. So what does that mean? It means that grace is greater than law. That's what it means say it again in case it didn't register grace is greater than law all day see because the law says you can't touch anybody or you'll make them unclean but grace says you can touch me because I can make you clean wow John 1 17 says for the law was given through Moses and don't give me the law was good it was perfect but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace is just better. Jesus, the greater Moses. See, the law demands that you stay away. Grace suggests that you come near. The law says you don't belong here, but grace says you're welcome here. The law says you're guilty and you should be punished. Grace says you're guilty, but I'll take the punishment for you. Let me say it again. If you trust in the promises of God while clinging to the work of his son, Jesus Christ, then you have unstoppable power at work in your life. This woman had complete faith in the power of God. And look what happens. Verse 29. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. 
and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt better. She felt free. For the first time in 12 years, she is shoulder to shoulder with strangers without fear of rebuke. For the first time in 12 years, she can be around others without hearing the constant mumbling and insults, unclean, unclean, unclean. Keep in mind, Jesus was on his way to help Jairus' daughter. I love how accessible Jesus is. You see that? She could just walk right up to him. He was available to those who needed him. I want you to know that I, I, I want to be like that with you. Like, I think church is funny sometimes. You know, I'll, I'll have people that seem to really want to connect with me and maybe, maybe would really benefit from, from some conversation and, and, and just me being able to speak into their lives and encourage them and pray with them uh, and, and help grow their faith and be there for them, right? But sometimes in, in, in the church, there's a lot of, like, hesitancy about that. What I hear a lot is, um, before somebody asks to spend time with me, they'll say, well, I know you're busy, or, or I know you have a lot on your plate. It's kind of like, I'm thinking to myself, okay, but like, doesn't everybody? Because see, the word pastor comes from a Latin word that means shepherd, and it's, it's not noun use, like little shepherd boy. It's verb use, thus describing the act of shepherding. We have eight pastors on staff here at the Crossroads Church, and we say it all the time in our Thursday meetings, a shepherd will smell like the sheep. You just will. And, and, and hear me, we aren't interested in leading you one day a week. Don't get me wrong. We love Sundays around here. This is good. This is good, folks, and we love it. But we're interested in leading you every day. And our team is extremely accessible. Reach out to us. Put us to the test. Take us to coffee. Let's talk. Let us encourage you. Let us do what we're supposed to do. Jesus was available. Jesus shows us in Mark 5 how important that really is to be available. Let's keep moving. Verse 30 is something interesting happens. Check it out. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And what an amazing moment this is, right? Because not only had something happened, clearly happened to the woman, but something happened to Jesus too. I don't know what it felt like. I don't, I don't know if it hurt Jesus. I don't know if it like stung a little bit or like, I don't, I don't know. Have you seen the Green Mile? First thing that popped in my head was the Green Mile. Remember when, when John Coffey healed Paul Edgecombe? At the, at the jail cell, in that scene, it's an exchange, right? John Coffey, like, like, sucks it out of him or something, right? It's, like, really weird, and then sort of, like, coughs it out into the air. Uh, I don't know. It's strange. But I don't know what happened. I, I, I just, I want to focus on that line for a moment. Jesus realized that the power had gone out from him. That's a pretty incredible thing to think about. See, because that means that his power is personal. We can see it, we can touch it, we can engage with it, we can notice it, right? See, because we tend to think of God as this, this, this massive cosmic being that, that's not impacted by anything that we do, and, and, and that is true. We serve a big God, and He is not swayed or influenced by us whatsoever. But the realization that He feels every movement of power, whether it's power in grace or power in wrath, it's, it's quite beautiful. It's humbling. Because Jesus experiences this act of faith by the divine power that flows from him straight into this woman. Check it. So that means that Jesus also experiences all those folks walking around him that day wanting to see him, but lacking any real interest in knowing him. Think about it. He feels every act of faith and every act of lack of faith. That just, like I know there's no way that we could possibly comprehend that, but the beauty and, 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 and the 
burden of that is just unbelievable, incomprehensible. We can't possibly understand that. But Jesus has a personal and intimate connection to each one of us, with all of us, not just believers. Everybody who has ever lived has a personal relationship with Jesus. You're either, Jesus is either personally involved in your redemption, or he is going to be personally involved in your judgment. See, I would imagine that the emotional roller coaster that Jesus was on, the highs and the lows of someone's act of faith and then someone's lack of faith, must have been really hard for him to carry. It's eye opening. Look at verse 31. The disciples say, You see the people crowding against you, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? They're confused. See, there was a big difference between the crowds pressing against Jesus and this woman touching Jesus. Now, to be fair, the disciples didn't know what we know until after the fact, right? They didn't, they didn't know what this woman was thinking until after they talked to her, right? They didn't know what Jesus was thinking until after they talked to him, right? But this is a tense situation. The disciples, they're trying to help Jesus through the crowd, and it's tight, and there's a lot of people. Like, get real, Jesus. Like, you see all these people? Everybody's all over you and hanging on and pressing against you. Jesus, we don't understand your question. We want to know who touched you. We can't help you because, <laughs> quite frankly, Jesus, everyone has touched you at this point. See, the disconnect is that the disciples are talking about the crowd. Jesus is talking to the woman. Jesus knew what happened. He doesn't need an update. Right? Like, quick tip for your Bible study time, just in case, you know, I'm just going to throw it out there. When Jesus asks a question, it's not because he needs your help finding the answer. Right? It's because he's working another angle. He wants you to see something you can't see unless he asks the question. He wasn't going to yell at her for touching him. How dare you? He wanted to know her. And he wanted to let her know that he cared about her needs. She also needed to know that it was her faith that healed her. And not just that, but Jesus, I love this, Jesus was giving her an opportunity to go public with it and restore her reputation completely. And we'll get to that in a moment. But here's what I want you to see in this moment. There's a difference between those that crowd around Jesus to see something amazing and those that reach out to touch Jesus in faith. There's a difference. Or let me just put it like this. You can be around Jesus without actually being the one who has touched Jesus. See, all the noise and the chaos of fanfare, and Jesus only wanted to know about the one touch. All the things going around him. And just the one, one touch from a woman that knew she needed Jesus meant more to him than anything that that crowd could give him anything see don't miss this jesus is showing everyone the priorities of the kingdom of god in fact later he would teach about these priorities check it out in luke 15 we're told of we're told of those priorities jesus says i tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent priorities. See, the scary thing about the local church is that you can fill a room full of people who think Jesus is awesome, but still only have a handful of them reaching out to touch him. See, a lot of folks, they like to show up to see what Jesus is going to do next, with no desire to see what he can do for them. It's a bit of a scary thought. But if you trust in God, and you cling to the work of his son, if you reach out and you cling to it, then you will know and he will know that you have touched him. See, that crowd, they wanted to go to Jairus' mansion. They've been looking forward to it. They wanted to see the Jesus show. Right? They got a good deal on StubHub. They've been planning this for months. Like, let's go to Jairus' house and see Jesus do awesome things. And it's sad but true. There are no shortage of Jesus shows going on these days. I mean, just look at these, look at these megachurch models. Look at some of these megachurch models. I'm not saying they're all bad. I'm not anti-megachurch. 
But the modern church has sold out to the show. So people show up to see the show. Let's go. Who's singing today? Man, I sure hope it's Eli. Who's preaching today? Man, I hope it's Steve, because Josh really got a lot to learn. I, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, <laughs> what's the sermon about, right? You're not after Jesus. You're after the Jesus show. Man, this, this woman isn't interested in the show. She wanted to touch the sun, the promised one. She was reaching out because she was desperate and she believed Jesus could help her. Jesus isn't a road show, folks. He's the king of the universe. God incarnate, Jesus the Christ. Her touch was different because she believed in him. Twelve years, folks. Twelve years. Do you really think Seriously, do you really think that people would just believe that all of a sudden she was good, she was better? Oh, it's all good. No. But Jesus is going to give her an opportunity to tell everyone. Look at verse 32. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. He refuses to let her pass up on this opportunity. I can't underscore this enough. Jesus isn't ticked off that she snuck up on him. He's not looking to provide some accountability in the situation. He's not about to rebuke her for touching him, even though Levitical law clearly states she should not touch anyone if she can help it. He wanted to know her. He wanted to show her that he cares. He wanted to encourage her in her faith. See, Jesus' question about who touched him, it doesn't mean that he was uncertain or that he does not know all things. He knows all things. What it shows us is that public displays of faith and obedience matter to God. He wanted her to make the announcement of what just happened, not him. So finally, she's willing to reveal herself. 33. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. It was me. Jesus, it was me. I'm the one that touched you. And what was her response to Jesus asking, who touched me? She fell at his feet. And she worshipped Jesus right then and there in front of everyone to see. She fell. Talk about a church service you'll never forget. <laughs> That's amazing. Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call on me in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Psalm 107, 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. See, when the Lord comes through for you, his question is always, Who touched you? He wants you to tell your story. He wants you to testify. He wants you to be a witness for all to see. See, because a breakthrough from God is never a secret. It's never meant to happen in the privacy of your home. It might, so that you can come out and scream about it. Tell people. Somebody always needs to hear it, right? And when they hear it, it should bring glory to God. See, the woman can't hide in the crowd anymore. Mm -mm, no crawling in the dirt. You're done. Those days are over. No, you got a story to tell, young lady. You touched Jesus Christ, and he touched you. If you just raise your hand and say, thank you, Lord, if you've been touched by Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord. And like many of us, we need to wear that on our sleeve better. What's going on? Like, we got it all neat and tucked away, and far too often it's a chore just for us to pull that out. Don't lose your first love, Jesus said. Don't forget what he's done for you. Look at how this moment concludes. Verse 34. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He called her what? Daughter. Daughter. And talk about dismantling fear. In fact, this is the only time in the New Testament that Jesus addresses a woman as daughter. See, when we started this story, she had no name. 
She was being overshadowed by a synagogue leader with money and influence, right? She went from being a nobody to being a daughter of the king of mercy. Jesus took her from being nobody to being somebody. Jesus uses the Greek word sozo. It means to save or to rescue. It's, it's used in the Bible to, to, to describe uh, salvation, God's gift of salvation. Jesus says to her, your faith, your faith literally has saved you. See, this woman had a need that couldn't be met apart from an act of God. This woman had been humbled. She knows she's a sinner. She lives with the reality of that every day. She lives with the understanding that something is broken and she's tried everything she can, but nothing has worked. She can't do anything about it. She's helpless and she's hopeless. But after hearing about Jesus, she comes in faith with complete confidence that Jesus can heal her. She knows who he is when she's working her way through the crowd, being called names, and she knows who he is when she falls at his feet to worship him. And now, after talking to Jesus, she knows who she is. She's a daughter of the one true God. God restored her health. God restored her reputation. God restored her family. God restored her marriage. God restored her faith. Jesus closes this miracle with a command. Shalom. Anyone know what that means? Peace, right? But you see, it's so much more than just peace. It's more than just like a feeling of being good inside or being at peace or at rest. See, over in Israel, when they say it, it points to a fullness or a completeness of life that only comes when you're in right relationship with God. That's shalom. And you simply cannot experience that kind of peace until you've touched Jesus. Have you touched Jesus? Have you? See, I want you to know today that Jesus isn't avoiding you. He's not evading you. He's accessible and available to you. Accessible and available. And you aren't just another one in the crowd to him. You aren't a nobody. You matter to him. He cares about you in a personal and intimate way. And even if it seems like he's busy or he's got too much on his plate, how could he possibly find time for me? If you step out in faith, he'll recognize your touch. He'll recognize it. No matter what he's doing, no matter how busy he is, he'll recognize your touch. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, is inviting you to reach out and touch him. Believe in the name of Jesus. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by faith you may have eternal life in him. If you do this, Jesus will close out your story with a miracle of shalom too. Philippians 1.6 says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If you would like Jesus to begin a work in you today, just reach out and touch him. He's here. Go to your heavenly father in prayer and tell him that you need him, that you need him to forgive you of your sin. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the son of God sent to save the world and that resurrection power that Jesus used to empty the tomb will one day be yours. John chapter 6 verse 37, all those the father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. And so here's the question for you to answer this week in your heart. Are you his? Or are you still your own? I hope you'll join us next week as we see how things are going with Jairus and his daughter. I'd like to lead you in a time, a very special time, in the body of believers communion, the Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it, but this is an intimate setting. In fact, there are very few ways as a follower of Christ that you can, you can literally reach out to touch Jesus. And this is one of those moments where we get engaged in, in a reaching out. We have baptism, great way of reaching out. 
this moment where we hold the items that, that remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, it's so important in the life of a believer. And a lot of people have a lot to say about, well, you know, when, how, when, how often. Look, we do it every week here because we don't want you to miss it. Okay? If you don't want to do it every week, don't do it every week. Do it when you want to. We just don't want you to miss it. A chance to reach out. A chance to hold the items. A chance to remember the risen Christ. And so I just want to pray for this time.